Welcome to another episode of the Homestead Shop Talk Podcast with Al from Lumna Acres, Ben from Holler Homestead, and myself, Jason, from Sutherland, and we are hanging out in the shop today. And this is episode 39, and today we have a topic today. Amazing. Um, so we were just talking before we got on, and I already forgot. Um, can Can you be a doomsday prepper and a homesteader at the same time? Does that sound right, guys? Yep. Yep. <laughs> well, those two mindsets like collide. Can you do it all at once? Yes. And we're going to talk about that. But first, let's get into what we got going on currently and what we did this week. So how have you guys' week been? It's been a busy week. Honestly, like, I would have to, like, sit down and go over some notes of what the heck I did last week. It was such a busy <laughs> week. And then this, this weekend was just, like, the cherry on top and i don't know yeah <laughs> i worked on the uh the footer for the house a little bit uh worked <laughs> in the garden a little bit uh forgot about my peppers forgot to bring them in and the next morning got up and we had had a frost and they were all oh. mush so i got to restart all my peppers um uh, and then this weekend we went and helped some friends butcher a couple pigs so that was what we did this weekend. We we uh, nice. were about elbow deep. Oh, I don't know. It was like Friday evening when we got there, Friday afternoon, and we processed them. I'll have to send you some pictures of my friend's uh, cool trailer he built. It looks like a tiny home. Like, it's the most beautiful <laughs> thing, like, I have ever seen. Uh, it's Fancy got like fridge. a... <laughs> uh, yeah, it's like the world's fanciest fridge. Uh, <laughs> enough room to hang two whole pigs uh like it's got space if you want to you could actually set up a table inside the trailer and process inside the trailer if you wanted i mean it's nice. just it's slick it's cool uh i'll have to ask him if he minds if i share pictures of it but yeah pretty cool pretty cool setup uh kind of made me a little bit jealous uh seeing seeing everybody's setups is kind of something that's nice because it gives you ideas uh, how you yep. want to do it when you get to it and stuff like that. Yep. I I know that we want to make a walk-in. We've been talking about building a shop and we'll probably do a walk-in of some kind, but yeah, I don't know. We'll, uh, we'll cross that bridge when we get there, but it, it definitely made me, made me jealous. Uh, I'm looking <laughs> forward to the day that I can, I can build something as awesome as that. But yeah. well, other than that, the yeah. Used to be. Uh, the trailer, I think like it was an old kind of junky trailer, but the axles were good and you know, there, it wasn't all rusted out. Yeah. Um, it was like a little, I would assume it was probably like a 10 foot trailer, something like that. Okay. And he went in and basically built a house, insulated That's it cool. and then did the cool bot thing. And you could stand up in so. it. Oh yeah. It had eight, eight foot ceilings mm. like wow. at the lowest point yeah. it was eight feet pretty tall cool it honestly it either looked like a tiny home or like a catering uh trailer of some kind yep. yeah that's cool so yeah that was kind of my my week in a nutshell how's the weather been down your guys's way it was hot there for a minute yeah it was hot like thursday friday wednesday thursday friday something like that it like 70s, it was pretty hot but i think now... it got up to 80 on thursday it was nasty. Oh, wow. I'm not ready for that. Yeah, that's the day we uh, we put the uh, plastic on our high tunnel. Nice. On the hottest Oof. hottest day of the week. Perfect. It was nice. <laughs> How'd it go? I got, I got sunburned. It went pretty good. At first, I was like, okay, we were starting to put it on, and then it wasn't windy the whole day. <laughs> and all of a sudden, it starts yep. to get windy. And I was like, oh, man. For a minute there, I was kind of like, man, I don't know if we could do this, which is, which is us three. You know, it was just us three doing it, and but then we just kept at it, and then finally the the wind died down a little bit, so we were able to do it. And it wasn't that it wasn't that bad. Um, my concern was it being not being tight enough, but it actually turned out really good. I was I was happy with it. Um, I thought it was pretty tight, and so the whole top's on now. All, the next step is putting the two end walls on. Um, but essentially, I mean, we could start growing into it. Right. right now, you know, or start bringing soil in. Did you buy the end walls or are you going to build them? I bought one end wall kit. I I think it's like a 
the whole thing rolls up. Okay. Um, and then the other side, I was going to build them, build one. I, I wanted to just, you know, just do something different than having two same end walls. I don't, I'm not sure what I'm going to do yet. So do you, are you guys ever uh, behind on videos, posting videos? Or you guys got a pretty good schedule going? What do you mean by that, I guess? Like this video that you post today, you actually filmed it two weeks ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're like a week behind. A week behind? Yep. I mean, you guys are pretty on a schedule, Ben, aren't you? Like, yeah, we're uh, we're pretty pretty much on a schedule. I think there's like a a one day delay there about. Um, yeah, but you get a time honestly, to edit and then post. Yeah, it's it's a little bit easier when there's like you know a week in between things. But yeah, generally right now we're we're pretty current. Yeah, so right about now in the in the year is why I start being a week or two behind. So the things I like. This high tunnel video will probably won't happen till next week. I probably won't post it till next week, just because you know you got a lot of stuff going on, and I got to sit down and edit. And you know, sometimes if things happen like back to back to back, like every single day, and I don't want to miss it, I have to film <laughs> it. Yep. But then that that takes away my edit day, <clears throat> and so I have a ton of stuff that I need to that I need to edit that I've already filmed. But do you miss uploading days then? Oh yeah, I mean I don't have a I don't, you don't a schedule. I really don't have a schedule of when I what day I upload. I mean I try in my head I try to keep it, but you know, sometimes it doesn't work out. Um and I just skip a couple days or three days and uh <laughs> I get to it when I get to it, you know. It bugs yep. me sometimes, but I do kind of like being at least a week behind. Yep. Because I feel like I'm less rushed. You know, like I like sometimes I'll get like, Oh my gosh, I gotta I gotta film something. Like I have nothing to post in, in like in my brain. I start like almost panicking <laughs> like because I don't have anything to post for like, it's been like three or four days. Um, So being a week behind, but then at the same time, when I start being two weeks behind, I tend to start forgetting what I filmed. Yep. And that's what gets kind of crazy because I don't even remember what I filmed and I still have to edit it. <laughs> I mean, as I'm editing it, it's, I'm reminding myself what I just did, but <laughs> it's still kind of confusing. So yeah, so the high tunnel, man, this week was busy for us. We have chickens come in. We had 60 meat chickens come in. We had 25 egg layers come in. Nobody died in transit. Awesome. Nice. So they're in the brooder. Currently, what else? We're waiting on- Did you get any on... extras? The meat chickens, we got two extra, and those two already died. <laughs> yep. <laughs> they died after like I think three days after they came. Um the egg layers I think they gave us one extra maybe. And those seem to be doing fine. We're on baby piglet watch, cooney pigs. Of course we're having a cold spell this week and so she should I mean, if our math is correct, uh she should be due this Sunday. Oh nice. So we'll see. We moved her to a spot where we need her. If we need to run a extension cord out there for a heat lamp, we could do that. Um, I'm trying to remember what we did last year for her, because last year too she had the pigs right around the same time, and it was really cold, but she seemed to do fine. Was she right on time last year, like close to her due yeah. date? She was. I mean, Lorraine, she's. I don't know. She's good at figuring it out <laughs> when she's going to have these babies. Because she's like, oh, she's, she was in heat this day. And, you know, yep. she starts doing the math and she's like, okay, the end of March, she's supposed to be due. So um, what else? Oh, I had sheep milk for the first time. What'd you think? Cool. It tastes like, tastes like milk. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't, uh, I, I don't know what I was expecting, but it, it honestly, I, I don't think you could tell the difference between cow's milk and sheep milk. At least I, I don't think we could have. I mean, even that same day, I, because uh, I got it from Red Bell Ridge Farm, which is the farm I get my feed from. I would go, they're uh, dealers, um, feed dealers. <laughs> my feed dealer. <laughs> dealer. What did my dealer? Yeah. Some raw milk while I was there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, try this. And they give me a, a glass jar full of sheep milk. They just started milking some sheep. So they're kind of new to it too. So. They're like, try it. Let me know how it goes. So I took it home. And, and that same day, Lorraine went and picked up raw milk from our raw milk dealer. <laughs> and we tried them both. And they taste the same to me. 
I mean, even the same like consistency, you know, it didn't, it wasn't water, more watery or thicker or anything like that. So what you get cream from sheep's milk or is it like goat's milk where it's homogenized naturally? I'm not sure. They did say there is cream, but there was not cream in this. So I don't know. Okay. It might be kind of like goat's milk. I don't think as maybe not as much cream. Yep. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. I, I think we want to try it. <laughs> I want to try <laughs> milk on some sheep. I think we might try it. What breed do they have? It starts with a C. I think it's like Clun Forest, something like that. They're like a wool sheep, okay. so they have to shear them. Yep. Um, so I think you can have them for milk, meat, wool. But yeah, they're still kind of new at it too, so they're trying to feel it out. But they're using a milking machine to milk these sheep. Yep. So I was like, well, I need to go check it out because it seems interesting. It seems less intimidating than a cow, I feel. But the cow, know. you get cream. And you can make butter and ice cream. Well, apparently you could do this too with sheep. That was the the biggest downfall of goats is you got milk. And that was it. And you didn't get a ton of it. With the cow, at least you get a lot of it and you can make yeah. lots of different things. I guess that's it. Probably if you're going to milk something, you might as well milk a cow and get all of it. <laughs> get a bunch. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. When you can have ice cream every week, mm -hmm. you start seeing yeah. the, the benefits of having a cow. Yes. And the butter and yeah, all the yeah. Yeah. I mean, apparently you could do all that with sheep, but I don't know. I haven't done. I haven't done neither. So what do I know? Yeah, it'd be interesting to find out like how much milk you get per sheep, kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I forget what they told me, but so if you got a cow, you'd have a bunch of excess milk. You'd have cream for ice cream. You'd have a ton ton of milk for your pigs. I guess yes. that'd be interesting. Could you give your coonies milk, or they get too fat on that? I wonder. Yeah, I don't know. That, that's a good question because they are a lard pig. Yeah. If that's even, maybe if that's all you gave them, just feed them milk and right. let them graze or even feed them less grain. That might be a thing. That'd be interesting. So I've been trying to finish my fence. I'm kind of over my fence, but <laughs> I, need, I need to just go out there and just get it done. I'm trying to force myself to get up super early and just like, just stay outside and just, just try to keep at it. Power I mean, through. Pretty much yeah exactly like one side of the i gotta put i'm putting high tensile the rest of the rest of the wire one side is pretty much done i could it's i could charge it or energize it right now if i need if i wanted to um so i'm just like keep going and i feel like it's almost there i just have to do the little details on putting it all together but you just need to like go find some animals and be like, okay, I'll pick them up in a week or two and give yourself a hard <laughs> deadline. So you have to get it done. <laughs> that's how it is. Right. Yeah. I know. That's how, that's how it works. Yeah. I work better under pressure. I feel. <laughs> yep. Let's see. So we picked up feed and picked up a bunch of uh, broiler feed. So that should, you know, so 2000 pounds, I've figured it should be enough for four rounds of Cornish cross chickens. So four rounds of 30 for 2,000 pounds. It should be like just enough. Um, and that's why I went in the Cornish Cross this year because, man, you can't beat the turnaround. And it's, it is cheaper, you know, than the Red Rangers. You just can't beat it. Uh, let's see. So with feed, I mean, this happened all this week, guys. I mean, we picked up 35 yards of compost. Whoa. You went and for, got it? For the high tunnel. I had it delivered. Okay, yep. I found a place, a, a local market gardener, that I met that I know he's a farm he uses this compost and I had it I mean it came from three hours away oh wow <laughs> and I mean it's hard to find mm -hmm. people to deliver stuff where we're at because we're kind of in a no man's land over here um, <laughs> but it was still a lot cheaper than what other places I've seen mm -hmm. Um, and I figure if this market gardener is using this stuff and he's growing vegetables and selling them, I'm like, well, it must be at least decent. Um, so now I have a pile of soil sitting in my side of my, my backyard that I need to move <laughs> to the high tunnel. <laughs> How far from the high tunnel? Oh, I don't know, maybe a hundred, 200 feet or something. Yep. <laughs> So we'll see how that goes, but <laughs> at least I have it in, uh, because we need it because that soil where it's at, it's like super hard. 
I'm not growing anything. I need to add to it in that high tunnel. How many dump truck loads? Was it that? was one. Oh, it was a one. long. It was a long. It was like the max that that truck could hold, I guess. Yeah. Um, and he was able to back up and just dump it. Cool. That must have been a big dump truck. It was big. I wouldn't. I didn't think it was going to be that big when I saw it because I <laughs> thought, oh yeah, it should have no problem. And then uh, he showed up, and I was like, uh. But he backed it up, no problem. Like he he didn't even bat an eye. He was just like, all right, that's where you want it. Okay. It's so awesome. He was good. What he what he did. We managed to go to a a farmer's market this weekend. Asheville more farmer's market. Didn't really buy anything except for apple cider. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't really have anything. We just went just to go. Still kind of early in the season for a farmer's market. Yeah, it's a year-round farmer's market, which is crazy. They have their two big farmer's markets are both year-round, and they're 10 minutes from each other. Oh, wow. And we went to one, and we couldn't even find parking because there was, like, a line of cars to park. And we're like, oh, forget it. Let's go to the next one. So we went to the next one, and that one had better parking. And um, even though it was, like, their off-season they still had quite a bit there and there were a lot of people just walking around um they, they didn't really i mean it has a few veggies um maybe two people were selling meat no chicken i don't see any chicken like whole chicken or anything like that but like one guy i saw he was raising organic grass-fed pork i'm always amazed by people who sell that because you know the feed's expensive yep and especially for pigs and it's like they're doing it whether they're doing great or not i don't know but they're they're selling it what was the price per pound on some of the meat for the pork did you oh, see I that no no i don't remember yeah they were trying to sell csas i think mainly yep i don't think they were selling it individually so i think they were trying to sell like holes and halves pretty much and yep. subscription type things yeah i think that's about it so what's up al is it snowing still um it's been flurrying on and off today yep on Thursday, I think it was Thursday, we were like high 50s, um, almost 60. And then, yeah, it's just been getting cold since. So we had a nice, warm, sunny day. We had some warm, sunny day, or warmer, sunny days. And then Thursday, it was like six, almost 60. And then it's just been getting cold ever since. But on the flip side, we butchered our sheep this, uh, what day did I do that? I did that Saturday. And then we had nice cold weather. So I was able to hang her outside for till today. So, I was like, I'll take advantage of the colder weather for sure. So who butchered it? You did. Cooperated. I know. I was surprised. Yeah, I sl I harvested her Saturday myself, and then hung her up, and then today we took her down, and then we cut her up today during the day. So I got a question for you, Ben. Do you find a sheep is easier to do everything? Not the not the cutting up of the meat, but of the skinning in the gutting than a pig i don't know i don't know if that's like fair um doing a doing a sheep to me was just like doing a deer um yep. actually like when the sheep i did last year i actually went and got the air compressor to see if you could blow the hide off the body and it somewhat worked uh so i mean i thought that was kind of cool but yeah i i'm not sure i i think any animal you can skin that has a hide is just easier and quicker. Yep. And then, you know, having the rumen, everything just comes out in pretty much one big chunk. Um, I thought the sheep were pretty easy. We, uh, we did them pretty quick. They were pretty straightforward. I mean, I didn't, I wasn't scared of them. First time I ever right. got my hands inside of a pig, it was a little intimidating, but uh, I don't know. The sheep, uh, pretty straightforward, I guess. How, That's what I you, thought. I thought the sheep was a lot him? easier. What was that, Jason? How'd you kill him? I did it with my 410. Mm. Oh, you shot him? Oh, yeah. Well, it was just one. Yeah. They didn't move? They were, they were, it was pretty Yeah, I, she, easy. I put some. She came. So we have a bunch of different spots in the field, and she came down to one of the lower spots by herself, and I just put the put a little bit of food up. She went to eat it, and lights out. Mm. That's the only one you have, right? Yeah. We had two. One of them died right away pretty much from worms. Mm. And then she made it through. What, do uh, you know the pounds? So 114 hanging weight 
And then once I once I took the hide and the head off, she weighed 86. And then once she was down to everything, she was 51 pounds. It's amazing how much weight you lose with, you know, guts yeah. and skin and mm -hmm. all that. Yeah. I was like, wow. I thought it was a lot easier to do that part versus a pig. But I feel like when we were cutting the meat up, it was a slower process than a pig because everything's so much smaller. Yeah, I'll give you that. You got, you know, it's so much more time consuming because you're holding a bunch of little stuff. You don't have like the weight of the carcass or of your or your primal cuts holding stuff. You kind of have to, I don't know. It was uh, maybe a little more tedious cutting up the sheep into the cuts yeah. of meat. See, I, uh, when when we did sheep, uh, I kind of cut realistically for our family. And yep. one big sheep I could actually get decent cuts out of, but the two smaller sheep that I did were so small. I broke it down into just like quarters and we just packed those up. It was like holding up one, one leg. It's like, yeah, this is one meal maybe. And so I just wrapped up the legs and stuck them in the freezer. And sure enough, I'm glad I did because like one leg is a meal for us. Right. Yeah. I'd say she was medium size. So we got, we got like the loins, tenderloin. We did some boneless stuff. Then we got, the chops one side i did chops and the other side i did rack of, what do they call it rack of lamb or lamb rack whatever but yeah on the smallest when you cut everything up it's kind of you got to be more precise than a pig because a pig you have more room to work with it seems like did you do it all in a day the cut up part yep yeah it took us almost all day to do to cut up we did grinding and cutting and filming and packing and yeah did you film it yeah we did oh nice Yep. And you did it all in your new barn or in the house? We did it. So I did the harvesting part outside in the barn, used the meat pole, and then we brought it in the house and just did it right in the kitchen island, which was nice. The meat pole. The meat pole. So I hung it up in the air like 12 feet off the ground probably, the meat pole. You should, in you the should, have, some, you should have some T-shirts made and just have it say meat pole meat like pole. in the chest. <laughs> Let people let people ask, like, what does that mean? What is I have to come to my house and I'll show you. My <laughs> ask me. Ask me about like, my meat. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's a bummer sticker. the inner 12-year-old in all of us. I know. Oh, my <laughs> gosh. <laughs> I took our dog to the vet for the first time this week. He ended up weighing... 34 pounds so he's bigger than our miniature australian shepherd almost weighs as much as our double doodle and he's only he was what 13 14 weeks old when i brought him mm. it's a big puppy yep it is me big and that's the goal we want the we wanted the biggest one we could get brutus brutus to scare up the coyotes <laughs> that's great he's doing good it's fun training him so we'll see see how it goes so far he hasn't come in the house yet so he's mm. living in the barn, he stays in the barn at night. And then right now he's out in the day when we're working, he's with us. And then he's out in the kennel right near the cows during the day so, to watch him. So those dogs, I mean, they're basically going to work mainly at night. So yeah, they're supposedly nocturnal. And then during the day, they're just kind of chilled out. Yep. They're usually doing a lot of their sleeping during the day. Mm. But so far, I don't know if it's because he's a puppy or not, but he's active during the day. Mm. You let him roam around at night? No, right now we just put him in the barn. Oh, okay. Yep. Yeah. Trying to teach him that this is his area. Like, this is where he needs to stay. Because there's so many different things, different ways to train him. We want him to roam at night, but we want him to roam near the animals. We don't want him taking off and roaming the woods. You know what I mean? We want yeah. him by the animals, protecting the animals, and not just right. going, hey, I'm going to go browse the woods and come back exactly. in the morning kind of thing. So we're trying to teach him, like, no, this is home base. Stay close. Right. So I think thinking about getting a GPS tracking collar for him. So that way, if he does roam and I can't find him, at least I can pull up my phone and find him. But also go, oh, hey, this is where he was all night long. Like, this is the loop he did or kind of see what, what's up with yeah. that. I think that'd be kind of cool. That'd be yeah, really like, cool. Why is he, yeah, why is he in this spot all the time? Or right. maybe there's something over there. Yeah. What did he do yeah. all night long? Yeah. That would be neat. That would be a neat video to do, to see if you can make that into a video. <laughs> I'm sure you could. <laughs> Might take a couple of days, but... Yeah. yeah. It'd be cool if it had, like, some kind of video 
camera on them or something. <laughs> right. That would be kind of neat. Have a little like strap a GoPro on them too with like night vision at night. You would I know you'd, you would think like it will, it'll work like a GPS. Like you can look on your phone and you like it'll be like two in the morning and you can look on a camera night vision or something and have it it's on him <laughs> and seeing like seeing what what he sees like yep. don't they have that <laughs> all right i don't know <laughs> they might it probably costs a lot of money but they might have something yeah I mean, that would be neat you yep. you would think they would have something like that already i started doing our new fencing down by the barn i'm just doing t-post and then we're going to do high we're going to do uh high tension wire so I think three strands. And then we're doing wedge locks. I don't know if you guys have heard of those for our corner braces. So the little, the little, they're little metal brackets that you put on your T-post. So you got your two T-posts and then you put a bracket up here on this side and then one down low on this side and you run your diagonal T-post. So it oh, keeps yeah. them for your gate. Are they plastic? Gotta, uh, no, they're aluminum. Oh, okay. I wish they were metal because they're, three pieces and one of the pieces I wish I could tack on but I don't have anything to weld aluminum myself so but so those are the corners those those will be the core I'm not doing it in the corners if I need to do it in the corners I will right now I'm doing that where the gates are so for the gates we're just doing metal well not metal gates we're doing wire gates but we're doing like the spring loaded gates so it's like a spring coil so it will stretch from like one foot to 16 feet Oh, yeah, I've so seen takes, those. Those are cool. Yeah. They work out. They work out pretty slick so far. But they take a lot of. They put a lot of tension on the T post, so you need to have a, a brace on the other on the sides, so you're not ripping your T post out of the ground. What's the fence for? So the fence is going to be for our cows we have now, and then we went and looked at more livestock. We we actually didn't even film it. We took the day off, and we should be getting them in like a month. So. <laughs> oh really? Like. So like we're not filming we're gonna go check we didn't know if we were gonna get him yet so we're like we're gonna go check him out i don't know we're gonna go to another farm they don't know who we are or we don't think they know who we are kind of thing <laughs> we just want to go incognito look at animals see if they're what we want kind of thing so like we're not gonna take any cameras so you bought some livestock we yeah we put a deposit on the livestock and you so don't want to say what they are no not yet okay <laughs> <laughs> No, we got, some testing, we got some on, testing. We got some testing we haven't done. Come on, Anna. camel! Come on, I'm, camel! I'm, That'd be nice. I, wanna... <laughs> People, I think that was supposed to be a big thing for a while. Is camel milk? I've never that had that. Well, oh, that should be fun. So I guess going into tonight's topic. So this is what got me thinking. If you're so if you're trying to, people. I think a lot of people correlate homesteaders being preppers. So can you have like a hardcore prepper mindset and still be a homesteader? So my thinking is. Like, yes, we're, we're, we try to prepare for a lot of things. Like, I guess like a Boy Scout, like be prepared. I am prepared kind of thing. Um, yeah. But can you can you have the prepper mindset, like the doomsday prepper mindset, but still have a homestead or a farm? Because I feel like if you have a homestead slash farm, you got to plan for the future. So if you're like that kind of prepper, can you really plan for the future? I don't know. Like just thinking about like cows, like cows take, what is it, nine months to get them pregnant. And then if you want to raise them out for beef, it's two years. You get to raise them up on grass for beef. So you got to, there's a lot of planning and processing and everything. So if you're like a prepper prepper, are you thinking that far ahead, I guess? Don't they? I always thought they did. I don't know. Like if you're planning for the end of the world, are you planning for growing like a big farm? Like for the future? Or are you just planning to... Like, to what, if, the like, what, if, the end of, like what if zombie apocalypse happens? Yeah. Like, getting prepared for zombie apocalypse, not... Um... I want to have, I don't know, canned vegetables next year. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like you could do both. One of them is more hardcore than the other, I, I guess. Couldn't you set aside some stuff and have both? Yeah, but you put, I don't know. Like we're, we're always, I think, preparing for stuff, but we're not, I'm not preparing for the, the apocalypse, I guess. <laughs> like, I don't know. To me, I guess I think of that. You're going to have like a bunch of freeze dried food in your basement and you're going to be going in your bunker. I, I don't want to live that way. No, no. I guess I don't. I don't think about that that end of it. What do you think, Ben? I don't know. It's an interesting, interesting idea. Like, can you can you still be a homesteader if you're a doomsday prepper? I think what's weird is like we didn't really get into homesteading because we were preppers, uh, right? But homesteading is kind of a way to prep. Um, 
this is like this is more of a way of life well i suppose so is uh so is being a prepper i don't know uh i think absolutely you can uh there's nothing wrong with being prepared in any situation in any way of life uh, if you want to grow your vegetables and can a whole bunch of them so you have a couple years saved up like there's no shame in that i don't know i uh i guess yeah you can absolutely be a prepper and a homesteader i guess one just doesn't have as much fear attached to it right yeah and you, maybe everyone just has their different why yeah i guess it would come down to a, a why like right why are you if you're homesteading because you're worried about the end of the world I don't know about you, but I've I've known some some serious preppers, and they they sit there waiting for the end of the world, and you know it's supposed to come on this date, and it never happens. And ten years go by, and they're like, you know what, this is dumb. Forget it. Uh, There's one guy; he just yeah. got rid of all of his his stuff. Like he just walked away from the whole prepper stuff, and. I couldn't understand why it was like, you know, at least eat your stockpiled food. If you, if you all of a sudden you're not worried about the end of the world, like that's a lot of time and yeah. money invested into all that stuff. But I don't know. He just like rejoined society in his thinking. So I, I don't know. I'll be a homesteader then. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Or, or you could maybe the opposite. Like maybe you get into homesteading and then that turns you into a hardcore prepper. You know, then you really start getting into it. Maybe that I'm sure people have those way of doing it, but I think if you remember, get home, homesteading, you kind of stop. I shouldn't say that. If you move to the country and you're homesteading, you start learning like, oh yeah, wait, like I want to have food for you know at least two weeks or something, just because oh you can't go the you're not running to the store all the time, you're not going here there. You know, for us, we get snowstorms, so you want to make sure we have food. Like we don't panic like oh my gosh we're getting a blizzard we better go to the grocery store and stock up and buy out all the bread and milk like everybody else does yeah or even just you know if you have an abundance if you grow an abundance of something and you know next year you're probably not going to grow the same abundance you know unless you're you know you might just luck out one year and grow a ton of tomatoes or whatever and you just start canning them you know that's you know that's how you get into it but um i remember one time this was some years ago. I met a hardcore prepper guy and uh, he wanted me to build him a walk-in cooler. And that was when I had just built Justin Rhodes cooler. Um, and then right after I finished that one, he got a hold of me. He was like, hey, I want you to build me a cooler. Turned out he lived like really close by me. So I, I was, went to go check out where he wanted me to build it. And he was a, he was a prepper. I mean, he had... I mean, he was expecting something to happen. <laughs> uh, I mean, he had a, you know, greenhouse. I mean, he, I forget what, how he was on some acreage. Um, I mean, he took me on a little tour. He had like a whole lookout tower. Um, <laughs> yeah. Like it was, it was wild. It was it kind of felt like the A team or something. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it never happened. I, I think it was just right before COVID happened. And so it seemed like when that ha I was going to do it, like the next day I was ready to go. Like I was, I was okay. This is what we're doing. And the day before he says, ah, oh, you know what? I don't want to do it anymore. I, you know, let's just wait. So I don't know what ever happened, but you moved away. Maybe, but <laughs> you're just kind of interesting to meet people. You know, I mean, it was cool. Like he was prepared for something, but I think it's probably, yeah, maybe it's just a mindset thing, I guess. I think I, mean, I like what Ben had to say is your why. I guess yeah. probably more than anything. See, right. I'm I've kind of find myself in a weird position. The amount of food that we have to stockpile uh, for our family looks like 25 years of food, but it's really only six months for us. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, like we've we've had people like walk around and go, "Why do you need so many bags of flour?" And it's like, "Oh, because this is you know the next three months. Like we just yeah. stocked up." That's true. And That's true. so, I mean, to other people, we look like preppers. And it's like, well, I wouldn't say we're preppers. We're just prepared. We we like to stock up that kind of stuff. Yep. Not to say that, you know, we wouldn't be all right if something hit the fan and couldn't go anywhere. Like, we got food. But I think the most yeah. important thing is, because of the homesteading thing, we are growing our own food. 
uh, we're currently in the middle of uh, kind of doing a count of what percentage do we eat that we have grown, you know, our day-to-day -day diet. You know, what is our daily amount that we we eat that we produced? Um, right now, it's kind of a rough time of year because there's no garden right now. Garden's not going to be producing for another at least a month. Uh, and so right now, there's a lot of grains. There's a lot of, you know, the the uh, the imports, you know, all the things that we can't grow. Uh, but as we get into summer, well, yeah, there's a lot more stuff that we eat out of the garden and then the meat and everything we will switch over and be eating all homegrown versus how it is now where it's like, well, really only the meat and the occasional can of green beans on a, you know, odd Friday night or something came off the land. So I don't know. I don't know where I was going with that. I forgot where I was going. But back to your point with like you guys stocking up with like flour and stuff, we have a a food co-op that we go grocery shopping at and they'll have like member days you'll get 10 percent off and it seems like whenever they have member days they have a huge sale on a lot of stuff and then you'll have like a dollar off coupon for a lot of stuff so we'll go in there and just stock up on all the fr the stuff and they're like they get up to the counter like oh you have 10 bags of frozen broccoli you got yeah i got a freezer at my house you guys have this stuff on sale why would i not stock up like <laughs> Yeah. It's like, this is just common sense, people. Like, so, I, yeah, I don't think a lot of people shop that way. It's like, I'm going to save money. I'm going to put it back in my freezer because we're getting low anyway. <laughs> Why wouldn't I? Yeah. But I just think that's like a funny response when you go, play, especially when you, you're going to the cash register and like the cashier's like, what are you doing? <laughs> like, I don't want to come here once a week. <laughs> right. I want to come here once a month and stock up. <laughs> Man, that, that, just rem all by the that, just rem that just reminded me of back when, you know, we were broke in our early marriage. Uh, we didn't have a lot extra and any meat we had, we bought the markdowns. And there was one grocery store that every, I don't know, six months to a year, they would put ground beef on sale for 99 cents a pound, which was a screaming deal. And we would go buy I think they had a limit or something but <laughs> we would go fill up a shopping cart with just ground beef and we'd get up there to the counter and the clerks would be horrified they'd be like are you making burgers for like a football team or something like this is so much ground beef and it was the same thing it's like we got a freezer we're gonna you know take these big yeah. packs these 10 pound packs and we're gonna break them up into single pounds and this is our ground beef for the year. Like, it's just stocking yeah. up. But that is so foreign and alien to so many people. It's actually kind of sad if you think about it, that seeing someone prepare, seeing someone, you know, look ahead to the future or just stock up because it's a good price is unusual. Yep. I think some people just really like going to the grocery store once a week. There's people that go daily. <laughs> like, it's <Yeah>. a highlight. <laughs> like shopping you know just i like going shopping like i'm just gonna go walk around the grocery store and drink a coffee or something drink a coffee or something <laughs> I don't know. all right in Asheville, you could buy you know you could drink a beer while you shop so <laughs> um, yep. it's relaxing i've heard i don't know we don't have one around here but i've i've heard that their costco has i think they're called business centers and you can go and buy like hanging halves of beef or good size parts really and then you can butcher it yourself so it's less expensive and it'd be a good way to learn butchering skills if you wanted to dude that'd be neat right i guess like it restaurants you know restaurants go there they buy their hanging i don't know if it's half quarters must be i think it's different but i think you can buy like whole sheep carcasses just hanging hey, why, don't, why don't grocery stores do more of that they used to there was I'm trying to think where i i heard it on a podcast that not billy's that long, podcast that was Spearco. He was talking about Sam's Club's uh, mm -hmm. uh, meat supply thing. I'd have to go. I'd have to go check out that episode. But it's the episode of uh, the Billy's podcast with uh, Jack Spearco. Yeah. There was an old. You can't just ask. Like, just go to a grocery store. Just ask him. Like, I don't. I don't want it cut up. <laughs> but they don't get it that way anymore. The grocery they store. They have it already cut up. They'd already they have it already cut up. So there was a different, I don't think it was the same podcast. I don't remember whose it was, but they were listening 
and they're like what we need to do to make like our food more re like our communities more self-reliant is that's what we need to bring back is like the grocery stores getting like half a cow from the butcher and they and they could get local meat that way and then the but the grocery stores don't like the most grocer butchers don't even know how to cut up meat anymore because that's not what they do yeah i could say yeah. they just get packaged meat or, yeah then what do they do <laughs> I don't know. What does the butcher do now? Just stock shelves? They slice deli meat, I think, now. <laughs> <laughs> they just weigh it for you, and that's it? <laughs> right. Yeah. That would be interesting, though. If you started a grocery store or something, or if you're like a small grocery store and, and just, you know, half a, half a cow, and somebody could buy that right. and save some money. Yeah. Or like, or like the grocery store, they could go to like a local butcher shop or a local butcher and they could buy half a cow or a whole cow and they could just bring it to the grocery store i wonder how much money a grocery store could save doing that way then like versus buying it from one of the big packers if it would be comparable or not right i mean i guess they probably would lose money you think yeah i don't know probably because they're but not buying it per piece right but that's what the one of the podcasts was talking about they were like basically a way to bring back like the food industry to more localize it an easy way to do it would be to bring back the local butcher shops and the in the yeah. local grocery stores yeah that's interesting i see like little mom and pop stores doing that but not like big chain ones if they can't even order meat like that i don't know right and say i wonder where the big mom or well, the small mom and pop stores i wonder where they get the meat like that if they find a local butcher that they get it from or a local yeah. farm or what they do that's another thing that we need to start <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Oh, what has it been along with the uh, notary notary in the back <laughs> it'll be uh <laughs> bulk supplies bulk yard equipment yeah. rentals uh yes. Yes. butcher uh, uh butcher services and notary <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah add it to the list you come out with your white lab coat on all bloody let me notarize that for you <laughs> <laughs> yeah Yes, and there's a post office in the back. Post office in the back. <laughs> Heck yeah, man. All in one shop. Actually, it's funny. Have you guys heard of a uh, tool library? No. Mm -mm. There's a tool library, and actually Asheville has one. And um, I was looking how to start one. And uh, I've been to the one in Asheville, but it's kind of like a, you know, like a book library, except you rent tools, but you don't. It's like a membership almost. I guess it's kind of like a co-op yep. where you pay like a yearly fee and the yearly fee can be, I mean, some of these libraries, they charge maybe 50 bucks for a whole year. Oh, wow. And you don't need to pay anything extra to rent a tool. It's just 50 bucks for the whole year and you can rent any tool that you want. That's um, kind of cool. And you can rent it for like a week, I think at least. I mean, they, of course they have like, I think they have like some late fees and stuff like that, but um but it's it's like minimal, you know. It it's basically kind of you're borrowing rather than paying, you know, hundred dollars to rent this thing. And I was looking at like, how do you actually start one of those? Not that I really needed to look into that, but I was I was curious, you know, because I like the idea and the concept of it, and I was wondering what that actually looked like, how to start one. Um, and there's things different things online that you could look at that show you how to do it. But I think they actually started having them, I think in the seventies and they were attached to an actual, li like a book library. Hmm. They were kind of in the same building. I think they started in San Francisco and you could rent out tools instead of books, which I thought was pretty neat. That's pretty cool. I've never heard of a tool library. The one I went to, this was some years ago in Asheville. I think they had just started and I went there, you know, cause Home Depot, they rent tools. And I needed to rent something. I forget what it was. I think it was a tiller. And I found out about that place, and I went there, and everything I wanted to rent, it was broken. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> like, well, I like the idea, but the tools can't be broken if I want. Right. You know, like, like they need to work. They need to be functional. So then I just ended up going to Home Depot. But you know, I mean, the idea is there, and that place is still there, still running. So maybe they, um, they were kind of brand new then. So. I, that probably would be the drawback is that you got to repair these tools. You know, I'm, I'm sure they get used a ton and uh, abused and stuff. So, 
I've never seen anybody treat a rental tool with kindness and respect. <laughs> you drive it, you, you ride it like it's stolen. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I don't know. That was kind of kind of cool to look into. Who knows? I just did a Google search. We don't have one near us. I want to say I looked at. There's maybe forty or fifty of them in the country. It's like one estate. Yeah, I think there's only one in North Carolina. That would be the hard part. Like you said, like getting the tools back in good condition or make sure they were still running and they weren't beat up. Kind of thing. Yeah. Or even getting tools, um, like enough of them to rent out like that. Yeah. I don't know. I thought that, that, that would be pretty cool. I don't know. I have, I've have, I have a handful of tools here. <laughs> I would just rent out. <laughs> the worst part is a lot of the tools, you, everybody needs them around the same time, like rototillers or chicken pluckers. Yep. Yes. Yes seasonal but there was one tool library that i saw i think it's in Port- i don't know where it is somewhere out west portland maybe i mean there's like grants that you could apply for and stuff that interesting like this one library applied for a grant it was a craftsman was putting out this grant and they, they i figure it was like twenty thousand dollars or something and they spent the whole twenty thousand dollars on all brand new craftsman tools so you look in their you know they had video of their library and it's just all battery operated brand new. it looked like a you know looked like a Lowe's you're walking into Lowe's with all these brand new tools but stuff like that it's like how do you know about this stuff you know as far as like grants and stuff like that you know there, there's stuff out there that people are willing to help you out with but it's just trying to figure out what that looks like you know and where to look but I think that's what makes it hard yeah I wonder if there's like a place you can go and just like search grants to find that kind of stuff or how, you know, how, how do these grant writers there's, there's people that's what they do for a career they're grant writers yeah and they work for nonprofits and stuff but... right so that's what I was doing on a late midnight <laughs> <laughs> looking up how do you start this tool library I'm gonna look this up I'm like man I need to go to bed <laughs> so this is what Jason does with his insomnia <laughs> I know that stuff interests me how people start that up man you know, and hear stories of people's like, oh, we started that back up in 1980, you know, a group of people just got together and we wanted to rent tools, you know, and it's like, what? Like, that's, I just, I find that so interesting. Pretty cool. I have to look into tool libraries that honestly, like if you could like be in a good community where people wouldn't just absolutely abuse stuff or steal it, like I think it could work. Uh, but oh, yeah. cer- certain certain communities might not. It uh, just depends. Uh, I don't like know. You gotta, I feel like you have to charge for something to keep them honest. Yeah. Keep people honest, you know? Like, you just can't be totally totally for free. You know, just upkeep. Like, wh- or what about, where are you going to have this at? Like, there's got to be some kind of shop you got to be in. Right. Or store or something. You know, that's, that's you got to pay rent at least. Somebody's got to be there to kind of run it, keep an eye on stuff. Yeah, that too. Yep. You're going to need a mechanic to fix the stuff that just needs to be, <laughs> yeah. you know, repaired, yeah. wear and tear type stuff. To me, that seemed like the most, uh, this, that's the biggest issue with these things is that the wear and tear and you need to hire somebody to repair these tools or you need to send them to somebody and they repair them somewhere else. But that to me is like the biggest expense that these things have. So the biggest thing I'm hearing is if you've started or know somebody who started a tool library, reach out to Jason because he wants to know how to do this. <laughs> I might, yeah. Yeah, I do, actually. Jason wants to know more, at least, before he starts. <laughs> I want to know what's going on. I want to know my options. I'd be like, oh, I got a walk-in cooler trailer I'd rent out and a chicken plugger. <laughs> I think a membership See, would probably be the best way to do it, but it'd have to be... I think it has to be more than 50 bucks a year. So that way you'd at least get people who respected stuff. Yeah. And again, if you're going to be charging a decent membership, you got to have some good tools, I guess, at the same time. So people would want to join. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know how that works. See, I could probably reach out to somebody and ask them who's done it, but I haven't gone that far yet in the rabbit hole. <laughs> people are going to be emailing you now to this podcast. They're going to be like, back in the 80s, I started a tool library. This is how you do it. Yeah. On that note, we'll end it there. All right. So I appreciate everyone listening and watching this podcast. And uh, thank you so much. You know, we're we're almost at 40 episodes, uh, which is pretty neat. Now, yeah. You know, just talking shop, just, uh, you know, 
little chin wag here and there. Never hurt no one. Um, <laughs> I appreciate everyone listening, watching, and I hope everyone has an awesome week, and we'll see you guys next week. Have a good week. Later. <laughs>